Welcome to the 2021 Founders Lecture, recognizing our superpowers, mobilizing our privileges to advance physiotherapy. The Founders Lecture is the keynote address at the annual conference of the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, CSP, which is the professional, educational, and trade union body for the United Kingdom's 60,000 chartered physiotherapists, associates, and students. This Founders Lecture was originally delivered to open the Physio UK Conference on November 5th, 2021. We are making this recording for the public on December 20th, 2021. Here we go. Recognizing our superpowers, mobilizing our privileges to advance physiotherapy. To begin, I want to tell you about one of my superpowers, which is flight. I can fly. And here's what I mean by this. Like so many of you, I care about social justice and I am involved in action within physiotherapy on racism, on LGBTQIA plus issues and accessibility. But because I'm white, straight and cis and able-bodied, it means I can fly away and leave behind these issues whenever I want. Hi, I'm Geeta Ramtari, and one of my superpowers is shapeshifting. I'm of mixed heritage from Indo-Mauritian and Irish parents. I can change my accent and my appearance to fit into a lot of environments. I deploy my superpower to strive for a sense of belonging wherever I am, but also to give others the comfort of familiarity when I interact with them. As I've got older, my shape-shifting powers are more refined, but also more selectively used to protect my sense of who I am and what I am to others. Hi, I'm Sudhir Daya, and one of my superpowers is voice. I am of South, Af South Asian heritage, grew up in apartheid South Africa, and now live in the UK. My voice, like my life, spans physical locations connecting my head and my heart. I use my superpower to protect my heart and to fit in by talking about everything that is nothing and yet saying nothing about that which is truly everything. Hi, I'm Andrea Wright. And one of my superpowers is I embody the properties of water. I find myself having to negotiate many states as a way to navigate both social and professional spaces to fit in, feel accepted, or to suspend other people's discomfort. To be solid as ice, I must exhibit strength and never fail. To be as fluid as water, I'm easy and just go with the flow. To be as invisible as gas, I blend into the post-racial landscape where colour is not seen. You see, as a tall cis woman racialized as black, this superpower enables me to survive in a variety of contexts where I adapt quickly to changing situations. Hi, I'm John Hammond, and one of my superpowers is invisibility. Let me explain what I mean. Like my colleagues before, I share a commitment to social justice, and particularly in physiotherapy education. But because of the body I inhabit, a white, cis, gay, older man's body, means that I'm less conspicuous or invisible in physiotherapy and health and social care contexts, where these identities are the norm or default. However, on the flip side of this, makes other aspects of my identity very visible. My voice, my actions and behaviours. And I use this invisibility, visibility superpower to work with marginalised others to mobilise action. So what are these superpowers that this Fantastic Five have introduced? In a nutshell, our superpower is awareness of the many ways we are structured in history, in time and place in positions of both privilege and oppression, 
and how we can mobilize these gifts in the pursuit of allyship. It's a deeper understanding of who we are and why that matters. The goal of this Founders Lecture is to mobilize the superpowers of not just this Fantastic Five, but right across the field of physiotherapy and beyond. For most of us, the idea of these superpowers, by which we mean having a finely tuned sense of our positions of both privilege and oppression, how we're structured in history, and having a good handle on what this means for action. For many, this may be relatively new on your radar. Or perhaps, especially given the events of the last 18 months, you consider yourself inside this journey and working on finding your way. Or maybe you've been in this work for a long while. Wherever you are in the journey, we need you here. So let's learn about where we are collectively. You'll have seen that every one of these answers, A, B, or C, includes ongoing learning. And so as a step forward for all of us together, let's deepen our understanding of this idea of superpowers. I'm gonna begin by introducing you to the COIN model of privilege and critical allyship as a way of making sense of the complex concept of privilege and what to do with it. You'll then have the gift of hearing my teammates reflect on the superpowers we bring to physiotherapy. We invite each of you to collect notes for yourself as we go. Please pause the video as often as you wish to collect your thoughts. Now it's important for me to acknowledge from the very beginning that the ideas I share today are not mine and they are not new. They're not mine and they're not new. They derive from a genealogy of Black and Indigenous thinkers for decades and centuries. And in particular, I honor the wisdom of two of my own guides, anti-colonial leader Lana James and Indigenous artist Lisa Boivin. I also honor UK physiotherapist Emmanuel Ovala, who has mentored me and brought me into this good work with these two teammates. So to our question, what are my superpowers? And if I can pay attention to what are my superpowers, therefore, what is my work to do? These ideas are also shared in this article, which you can find. It's an open access article you can find by Googling the coin model of privilege and critical allyship. And it all starts with the metaphor of a coin. This metaphor has three parts, the coin, top of the coin, and the bottom of the coin. So the coin itself is a metaphor for the big systems of inequality that shape society, that are historic, that were here before we were born, have shaped our societies, its institutions, and even ourselves. The coin is not about a few individuals. The coin is a social structure, a system of inequality. It's the isms. We don't get to opt out of these coins. We are in society. The question is whether we understand where we are positioned or not. And so the top of the coin, when one finds oneself on the top of the coin, it means that we get a benefit that others don't, that we didn't earn it. We didn't do anything to earn it. We have it just because of who we happen to be, how we happen to be structured in history. And the bottom of the coin is the opposite. You did nothing to earn it, but it's a disadvantage that you have that others do not. You have it because of how you happen to be structured in history. And in this metaphor, I call the top of the coin privilege, and I call the bottom of the coin oppression. And it's not that there's one coin for all privilege and oppression, it's that there are many, many different coins that will change according to context and history. And these forces, where one finds oneself on the top or bottom of these coins, it matters. It matters dearly because these forces shape who's healthy, who's ill, who gets injured, the kind of care we get where we find ourselves on the top or bottom of coins can influence and in some cases determine who lives 
and who dies. These are avoidable health inequity. And it's not just health, is it? These are also the forces that shape where we land in education, who's overrepresented in our classrooms, who's underrepresented, and the trajectory through the workforce. And it doesn't end there because these coins structure all the institutions in society. This is also the vastly different experiences that we have with policing or the justice system. And so let's connect it to equity. I want you to put your minds to the bottom of the coin for a minute. And I want to think about the terms we have to describe groups of people whose outcomes are worse because they find themselves on the bottom of the coin. Do it for yourself. Call up to the front of your mind right now. What are some of the terms we have, the common terms for groups of people whose outcomes are worse because they find themselves on the bottom of a coin? Yeah, it's terms like marginalized populations, vulnerable groups, hard to reach, hard to serve, priority populations, key neighborhoods, and on and on the list goes. Now let's turn your attention to the top of the coin. What are the common terms that we have in public health policy and research and education for the groups of people whose outcomes are better because of the unearned advantage they receive by virtue of finding themselves on the top of a coin. What are the common terms we have that are the parallel to the bottom? And I'll propose that we really don't have any. We do not have an easy nomenclature for positions of unearned advantage. And even trying to imagine what these terms might be is quite clunky. Unfairly advantaged populations, free list lift communities, right? And so I'd like to propose that often when we think about equity, what we do is we invisibilize that there is a top of the coin. We disappear the top of the coin. And I'll take it a step further. When we, we don't just disappear the top of the coin, often when we think about equity, we disappear the coin itself. And what ends up happening is that we frame equity as if it is exclusively the terrain of only the bottom of the coin. And that is dangerous. Why? What are the implications for equity? Why does it send our efforts backwards if we frame equity as exclusively the bottom of the coin? See if you can call up this logic in your own head. Why is it so harmful? Why is it counterproductive? Let me offer a couple of reasons. And the first is that what we frame as the problem in the first place instantly sets the universe of possible solutions that will follow. If we only frame the problem as the bottom of the coin, we will only come up with solutions to that part of the problem. We will never come up with solutions to address the problem of the coin, the system of inequality or the problem of the orientation of people on the top of the coin. And that brings me to point number two. How does disappearing the top of the coin allow people like me who find herself on the top of most coins, how does it allow me to understand my orientation to this justice? How does it allow me to be seen in relation to this work? How does it allow me to understand my motivations to be engaged in equity promoting work? If we disappear the top of the coin, it allows me to see myself as off the page, as totally unconnected, as neutral. It allows me to see my motivation as altruistic, generous, courageous. When what am I really? I am part of the system of inequality. I receive unearned advantage because folks on the bottom of the coin receive unearned disadvantage. I am complicit. There is no neutral. When you find yourself on the top of a coin, we are reproducing these coins until we are not. Second 
So can people be on the top of some coins and the bottom of other coins at the same time? Yeah, of course, right? That's all of us. That's all of us. This is the concept of intersectionality introduced by Black scholars Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill Collins to keep front of mind that we cannot consider only one coin at a time, that we need to be thinking about our simultaneous positions on the top of some coins and the bottom of other coins. And the same with our clients, our classmates, our colleagues, and that these relative positions will matter more or less depending on context. So what are superpowers? What are superpowers? First, it's knowing that there are coins. It's knowing and naming that there are systems of inequality that have shaped all of our institutions. And then it's knowing which coins we're on the bottom of. And that's usually pretty easy to see. When we're receiving unearned disadvantage, it's usually clear as day. But the big one is knowing the coins where we are on top, knowing the coins for which we find ourselves in a position of privilege, which is usually very difficult to see. And that's not by accident. These systems of inequality operate to keep us oblivious of our positions on the top of these coins so that we will continue to reproduce them. The goal of attending to these superpowers is to smash that oblivion. So it's tuning into what are my superpowers, because how I am structured in history, where I find myself on the top or bottom of coins, drives what is my work to do and how. Hmm. So what might that mean? What might that look like? Stay with me. Let's look at a few coins in particular to try and make sense of these ideas. And the first coin we wanna take you to is a coin that we call heterosexism, heterosexism. So heterosexism, the big social structure that has shaped many societies. Let's start with the term heterosexual. Heterosexual, being attracted to someone of the opposite sex. Well, assuming a gender binary, being attracted to someone of the opposite sex. Nothing wrong with that. Heterosexism, however, is the social structure that frames being heterosexual as the only right way to be, as the default norm, not just one way of being, but the right way of being. And so I happen to be straight. I find myself on the top of this coin. I receive unearned advantage from this coin all the time. I'm able to walk down the street uh, holding hands with my partner without risk of violence or ridicule. I get to see my way of being reflected and valorized as the right way of being in books and movies and popular culture enshrined in law and policy. And that is not an advantage that many of my friends and colleagues who are not straight get to enjoy. Now, Let's tune in. Am I saying that this is about good and bad people? Am I saying that people on the top of this coin are bad? No, I'm not. Am I? Absolutely not. This isn't about goodness or badness. Let's go back to the metaphor. This is about unearned advantage. I'm saying that folks on the top of this coin receive unearned advantage. And so if someone comes to me and says, Stephanie, you receive uh, unearned uh, life's easier for you because of heteronormativity. It's not an attack on my character. It's a statement of fact about how this coin works. Because who is more expert on how heterosexism and heteronormativity play out in society? Is it folks on the top of the coin? No, not at all, is it? Most of us don't even know there's a top of the coin. It's folks on the bottom. And so if I'm in that position of privilege and I am serious about practicing critical allyship, about making change. And I need all the feedback I can get about that position. Let's do one more. Coin of ableism, a set of ideas about there being a right way to move, to see, to hear, to think. I wear glasses, but I still get to count as able-bodied. 
Why is that? I can walk up three flights of stairs, but not 300, but I still get to count as able-bodied. Why? Because it's a set of ideas. Remind me, is this about good and bad people? No. Stephanie, you receive ableist privilege, not an attack on my character. It's a statement, a fact about how this coin operates in society and its feedback I need if I want to interrupt my complicity in this system of inequality. Because who's more expert? It's folks on the bottom of this coin. And yet who holds the power and resources most of the time to decide how accessible our meeting space, our way of engaging, our building, our website will be. It's usually folks on the top of the coin. So we can see the disconnect, we can see why we're in this trouble. So how do the coins do it? If these coins give unearned advantage and disadvantage, how do they do that? I'm gonna offer one way of thinking with three interrelated levels. First, is institutional. These are the policies, laws, practices, culture that we operate within. And secondly is interpersonally, how we think about and talk to each other. This is often where we hear about microaggressions, people on the top of a coin saying or doing something that harms folks on the bottom of the coin, often without even understanding why that was so negative, because we are oblivious to our position on the top of that coin and how that coin operates. Right? We're complicit until we are not. And finally, internally, the internal work. We have been socialized from birth, when you're on the top of a coin, to view ourselves as superior. Superior, and that doesn't feel good to hear. You're like, oh, that's not me, I don't feel superior. But here's how it shows up. It's because we've been taught forever that our position is the norm, the default, just the right way to be, as opposed to one way of being. And that internalized superiority is something that we need to unlearn. Just like on the bottom of it, we're socialized to understand ourselves as inferior, which also needs to be unlearned. So if these are the three interrelated levels at which these coins operate. They are also the three levels that are sites for resistance, sites for action. And so on and on the coins go, including this incredibly important coin of racism, the social structure that was designed centuries ago to give unearned advantage to people who have skin that looks like mine, people who are identified as white, and unearned disadvantage to folks who are assigned being racialized in order to deploy power, in order to dehumanize, in order to exploit, in order to justify the power over structure embedded in colonization and the transatlantic slave. And this is a complex coin because it's not just folks on the top who are given unearned advantage. There is a gradient on the bottom of this coin according to proximity to whiteness that positions blackness at the bottom, thus creating a new coin that happens globally and locally called anti-black. So how do we recognize our superpowers? How do we mobilize our privileges to advance physiotherapy? It's knowing there are coins, knowing the coins we're on the bottom and especially tuning into the coins where we are on top because here's the point. Here's where we've been heading. We want to work toward dismantling an inequity, right? Taking apart one of those coins because that's the problem, the coin. If we wanted to work towards dismantling a coin or an inequity, very different orientations are required depending on where we find ourselves. This workshop is tuning in, especially to those positions on the top of the coin, those positions of privilege and the orientation for action when you're on the top of a coin, some may call practicing critical allyship. 
there are a lot of names for this, actually. It's the ideas that matter more. But I particularly like from Rania L. Mugama, radical solidarity. So what is it? What is it? The Anti-Oppression Network describes it as an active, consistent, and arduous practice of unlearning and re-evaluating, in which a person in a position of privilege, top of the coin, seeks to operate in solidarity with folks on the bottom of the coin. Not how we've been socialized on the top of the coin, which is to save and fix and help those poor victims on the bottom. Mm. See how that logic no longer holds? But to mobilize this, we have to have a sense that there are coins and understand the coins where we are on top. Because where this is unchecked, where we are unaware of our position on the top of a coin, it leads to an irrational and illogical sense of neutrality. Right? This has nothing to do with me. I'm showing up from my altruistic urge because it's so unfair for folks on the bottom of the coin not because it, I'm accountable, because I'm complicit in this system. So in a rational sense of neutrality, expertise, sure, I should be in charge of writing that policy or I'm on the top of the coin. No, I'm the, absolutely the right person to drive that program, right? Where really, where's the expertise? And entitlement. So what is the role? when we find ourselves on the top of the coin, what is the special sauce we bring to the equation? It's power and safe. The power to have our voices heard, to put something on the agenda, right? to make claims that we can get away with safely, that we can advance in spaces where these might be unwelcome ideas. And when we're on the bottom of the and what is it we bring forward? It's an embodied expertise, but it's also often an experience of oppression, sometimes daily, and a risk of reprisal, right? Top of the coin, when folks bring from the bottom of the coin bring us feedback about these coins or our complicity in them, we frequently do not respond well. We respond in ways that teaches people you cannot trust us with that feedback. I'm only an ally in name, not in action. Hmm. Risk of reprisal. And the minority tax, who's holding the burden of trying to dismantle these coins? Right? They were started by people on the top of the coin, and yet the burden is held by folks on the bottom to do all of the work of trying to dismantle. Challenges that have been made all the more difficult during this pandemic. These are our community members, our family members, our patients, our colleagues. And so, what is the orientation we are inviting? each of us into, it's working across the coin. It's working across the coin for collective liberation, hand in hand in solidarity to dismantle these unjust systems. How, How where might we do it? Where might we begin? At all of these levels, institutionally, interpersonally, internally, these are all the sites at which these coins operate, and so they are the sites for resistance. And so, what are the takeaway messages? What is this reorientation we are being invited to take on? It's moving from this before position. This is me, my before. I, top of coin, use my expertise to help marginalized people on the bottom of the coin deal with inequities. And here's the reorientation. I see and understand my own role on the top of the coin in upholding systems of oppression. I learn from the expertise of, I give credit to, and I work in solidarity with folks on all sides of the coin, just like in this founder's lecture. And that this includes working with others who are also on the top of the coin to call them in, to agitate for change. All of this toward the goal of mobilizing in collective action under the leadership of folks on the bottom of the coin with specific critical expertise on how to dismantle these coins. That is practicing critical allyship.
And so, what just happened for you? What did you just learn or unlearn? Jot for yourself what is one new insight that you're sitting with right now. Now that we have a more nuanced understanding of what superpowers are, I invite you to listen in to these beautiful reflections from my colleagues, Gita, Sudhir, Andrea, and John, about their own superpowers and how they mobilize them to make change. To begin, it is my great pleasure to welcome Gita Roundhairy. Thank you. I'm going to take you on a personal journey, a personal journey of why and how I became a shapeshifter. But before I do that, to help us examine the why, I want you to take a few moments. Think of a time when you felt conspicuous, you felt different, you stood out. How did you feel? What aspects of that situation made you feel that way? Here's my story of why. In the first picture, the baby is unaware of her difference, but her parents are not treated the same. And her mother is already hearing comments about how her daughter will never belong anywhere because of her mixed background. The child is hearing herself described as half caste. What does that mean? She's in the car terrified as her father is stopped and searched by the police. They travel to Mauritius to see family and she's confused when she's called white by the family there. And here the teenager is at secondary school in a predominantly white town. She experiences racial slurs. She's an outsider at school, but she has no other non-white friends there as there are none. But she goes to the Mauritian events, that's her community. She loves the clothes and the music but she can't speak the language fluently and she misses the in jokes. So my shape-shifting superhero is Mystique from the X-Men. Over the years, I've tried to embody her and I realized that I had some ability to change myself as well. To change my hair, my clothing, to fit in with my English friends, my colleagues, my Mauritian or my Irish family. Code switching. That's a strategy used by many second generation migrant people where the style of speech and behavior changes according to where you are and who you're with. So different environments and circumstances lead to different shape-shifting requirements. So it can be an almost continual strategy. By assimilating to the majority, you may feel safer and more secure in that environment. You may feel more included and others will feel more comfortable and less guarded having you around. Their status quo is not changed, it's not challenged. Now along my shape-shifting journey, I realized that not everybody can shape-shift with me. Being mixed heritage, I have a lighter skin tone than my Mauritian cousins. People from other ethnic backgrounds may have other visible features that are different to white people. They may wear hijab or bindis, so these symbols of religion and culture will challenge assimilation as well. My cousins in this photograph are all from Mauritius, so their accents will impact on their ability to code switch. My ability to shape shift was due to my privilege as a light skin, able bodied person, my proximity to whiteness, my superpower. For me personally, it was tiring as I was always the one doing the work to change, to fit in. I felt as if I was starting to disconnect from who I am my history, my roots. I struggled to sit in between. It made me question my identity. Now this photograph makes me smile so much. Who is actually having to shapeshift or assimilate here? Not many. Now this founder's lecture is all about allyship and we all need to take up the challenge and change the structures that have made me need to shapeshift and left others on the outside who couldn't. And I want you all to think now about your teams and your departments. 
Are people expected to fall into how things are? What's the departmental culture? If people are different across any construct or coin, do they stay and thrive? Do they leave? Do they stay but stagnate? We all need to take the work away from others to make the change and take on the responsibility for examining ourselves and the environments that we work in. The fellow shapeshifters, don't underestimate how inspiring it is for others, for other people to see you coming through the profession, for you to be visible as you. And they'll see your pride in who you are and it's infectious. People may need support and mentoring to navigate how to succeed while being their authentic selves. I've started to take on this mentoring role and I pledge to continue this work. I invite you to reflect, activate and plan your own pledge. And now I'd like to invite Sudhir Daya. Thank you, Gita, for sharing your journey. As I reflect on my life, I realize how voice has been such a constant theme. And I'd like to share that journey of how my voice has developed from mouse to lion. Growing up in the 80s, I was spoilt by my mother's great cooking and baking skills. Every year, I would get a freshly homemade birthday cake. And on this particular birthday, she made me two superhero cakes. Great to see how superpowers are here with me today. My mom is also a physiotherapist and was part of the first group of non-white physios that were allowed to be trained in South Africa. Looking back, I realized that so many things were not vocalized in my family, community, or culture. And I was conditioned to ask myself, what would people say? This led to me losing my voice, as in my heart, I wrestled with the highly stressful feelings of shame, fear, frustration, and anger around my sexual identity in a society that perpetuates heterosexuality and cisgender identity as the norm. The shame of my voice being the telltale sign inviting other voices to ridicule, reject, and wound me and feeling that I had to apologize for my voice. It took me a long time to find the words and then the courage to say out aloud, I am gay. And despite all that work, I still muted myself, constantly scanning the environment for signs of when it was safe for me to sing my own heart song, or when I should instead blend into the mainstream chorus. To protect myself, my voice became harsh to others and even more so to myself. I'm still finding my compassionate voice and on this journey, I'm learning how my voice can harm, but also how it can help and heal. In the documentary, Touching the Sound, Famous musician Dame Evelyn Glenny, who happens to be deaf, describes sound and hearing as a form of touch. She explains how your voice creates sound vibrations that hit our bodies and our ears as a form of touch that is perceived as sound. As a physiotherapist who uses my hands to touch and treat clients, I appreciate how powerful touch can be. My training as a life coach echoed this in how powerful my voice and words can be as they touch another person. Yet my voice has still caused harm through my mistakes. I am trying hard, however clumsily, to prevent my cisgender voice drowning out those who identify as trans and non-binary. My male voice flooding what sisters, mothers, and daughters have to say. My able-bodied voice washing away accessibility concerns. My South Asian voice from floating away from social class issues. And my brown voice diluting black voices. I'm in a position where my voice can be helpful. My voice can speak for those who cannot speak 
can amplify those who are not being heard. It can call out, it can call in, and it can be silent and truly listen. I'm still playing with my voice, finding the appropriate tone, expanding my vocabulary and fine tuning my volume. I hope one day to use the superpower of my voice to sing. Sing in a choir with so many different voices that all our melodies can be heard in harmony as we create a song that heals. I wonder what is the song that might activate your superpower? Imagine. We now invite insights from our colleague, Andrea Wright. Thank you, Sudhir. I, like my colleagues, have an interest and work on issues of social justice within the profession and more widely. And when I say social justice, that includes the political. And when I speak about social justice, that necessarily includes my body, your body. And these are sites of political, economic and social concerns. The awareness that our bodies inhabit particular and multiple social locations and what they represent enables us to understand how we work towards true allyship. And indeed, what crucially is crafting a culture of care to advance the physiotherapy profession. I'm going to share some of these thoughts and questions that occupy me by way of a poetic inquiry. Into you I see, daughter of the sea. Using this analogy of our superpowers to help convey my particular attributes and how they can be mobilized towards transformative justice. I'm drawing on the African spiritual tradition of the Orishas, in particular on the Yoruba deity called Oshun, the water goddess. Into you I see, daughter of the sea. When do I ever see? See myself as a superhero, an extraordinary being endowed with powers so unique and sublime that people remember stories about you that become legends over time. Oshun, mother of the sea, endowed with abundant beauty, you are perseverance, fertility, life force and love. There is no life without you. And like the oceans, the vastness of my body reaches far beyond the imagination, any constructs or impressions of how I might appear. When do you see? I am water before you and where the depths of my presence may invite you to move closer or are there currents that can take you further adrift from what you fail to recognize in yourself? When you see me, you see me in the solidity, the strength of my bones carrying the stature of my being, the length and breadth of my back and like my ancestors bore the weight of the greed that tore them from their lands, their families and homes. Yet it disturbs you when I show my strength in the clarity of my words, defining my agency to be understood as aggressive or pushy. You see me when you witness the liquid flow of my nature, the joy of my smile, the ease of my being. Yet how do you react when I assert my boundaries or say no? Do you see me not as a team player, but as being difficult or obstructive? You see me like vapor, invisible to the eye, moving seamlessly in the world just as everyone else is, and yet when I make visible my lived experience, inviting you to see me with the multitude of nuanced expressions, the complexity of my material existence disturbs you. And it is true. I can inhabit all of these states, yet to be these things is to embody them and more. My superpower is not one dimensional. It is not limited to your experience of my human existence as a stereotype, a trope, and a fiction from the colonial imagination, or at worst, 
my internalization of such lies. And then I suspend in water. I pause. I want to breathe. What do you notice? What sensations and feelings are emerging in your body? Noticing is a superpower. What do you see in yourself? To see and experience me in all of my wholeness is to see yourself in all of yours. As Audrey Lord beckons us, do not be afraid of feeling. And with Oshun symbol of love, I understand these different states are also about being human, moving beyond assumptions of who we think we are. So I use love and compassion as my ally in service of true allyship. Love that seeks not to judge, is curious, open and kind. My capacity to see you is my capacity to practice the act of compassion. Love and humility combined is that great valve between me and you, between us and the world. What will you choose to see? And now I invite John Hammond to give his insights. Thank you, Andrea, for those beautiful reflections. So I would like to talk to you about how I engage my superpowers to be an effective ally in my professional practice. As a child, probably the last time I held a football, I began questioning my gender and sexual identity. As I developed my identity as a physiotherapist, I came to acknowledge, admit, and explore my sexuality in many ways. While I dragged up outside physiotherapy, I felt marginalized and that I did not belong in physiotherapy. But more recently, I've learned to recognize how my sexuality gives me insight and empathy. Nevertheless, that is not what I want to talk to you about. What I do want to talk to you about is those other aspects of my identity that give me power. My whiteness, my male body, and more recently, my age. These are aspects of my identity that allow me privileges that I've not earned. These can be dangerous if deployed without thought. These aspects of my identity have meant that I've afforded opportunities such as regular invitations to speak at Physiotherapy UK and other conferences. I used to tell myself that this is all down to my hard work as a teacher and a researcher. However, I cannot deny how my white cis male body have meant those opportunities have more easily ended up in my lap. Let me return to my superhero, Wonder Woman, and her superpowers. Wonder Woman has an invisible jet which enables her to travel without being seen. There is space for, her, for others to travel with her in safety and without fear. My whiteness is my invisible jet. My whiteness is not conspicuous in society where whiteness is the norm or is dominated and colonized. So this means I can travel or mobilize things quickly and effectively. And what I'm learning more is how I can use my invisibility to offer the opportunity for others to travel with me in the world of social work, in the work of social justice, anti-oppression and anti-racism work. As examples, I've used my superpowers to work with colleagues of color to write and design an anti-racist statement of commitment in my university and work with these colleagues to lobby for action within a system 
set to maintain white dominance. The Uzma superpowers to call out the invisible microaggressions when white colleagues ignore or dismiss the voices of black, Asian and minority ethnic colleagues or students and pay attention to mine. I ask you now to reflect on which of our speakers have resonated more with you and to ask yourself why. As an ally, I'm willing to show up, make visible and do the work to challenge injustices within classrooms, universities, physiotherapy and healthcare. But it's also a question of not just traveling with, but giving up my seat of power for others to take the lead. Wonder Woman's tiara offers her the superpower of telepathy. While I don't pretend to have telepathy, I utilize my superpowers of reading situations. Compared to the naivety of my earlier career, I'm now more acutely aware of where inequalities and discrimination may and do occur. My antenna are raised and alert to read the microaggressions. Where are you really from? So do you, as I have previously mentioned, I work hard to read these, whether peer or student discomfort, to acknowledge it and name it and address it. Lastly, I want to acknowledge that I'm no expert. I'm often clumsy and make mistakes, but what I do know is that I'm willing to lean in and do the work rather than stand back on the sidelines and watch others. So by sharing my superpowers, I invite you to reflect on a situation where you might have stood on the sideline and consider what might have made it easier for you to lean in. And I will leave you with the work of Kara Walker, whose art illustrates the violent acts inflicted on America's black population during the American Civil War. Kara deliberately stirs these feelings of discomfort and says that they should not be brushed under the carpet. She says of her art, it makes people queasy and I like that queasy feeling. In my work in physiotherapy and health education, I'm learning to get used to the queasy feelings and I hope and invite you to join me. Now I welcome my fellow colleagues back. Thank you, John. Allyship is not an identity or a destination. It's a practice, an orientation to moving through one's world. For the final chapter in our time together, we share with you questions we're grappling with ourselves in our practice of critical allyship to make our journeys visible and to invite you to grapple with us. For me, a question I try to keep front of mind is how to stop hoarding power so much. Or put another way, how do I redistribute the power I hold? The invitation to deliver this founder's lecture is an example of me grappling with this question. And how the move to literally share the stage resulted in the gift of collaborating with Andrea Sudir Ita and John, which came to light following a series of creative and caring meetings with a wide circle of UK physiotherapists, where we each brought our superpowers to co-design the session. I must also honor the wonderful CSP folks, the staff who were with us every step of the way. It meant slowing down the pace to widen the circle build trust, to share stories and dream together of a better future. And the result, this session is something more beautiful and powerful than I could ever have created on my own. And so as you move through your day, think of the coins where you are on top and ask, what actions can I take to share and redistribute the power I hold, not out of charity, 
but because the outcome is better for all of us. So my superpower questions to you are, how do we fine tune our spidey sense so we can be alert when someone's struggling on the outside, especially when we're comfortable on the inside? How can we avoid the need for others to shape shift if they can? And how do we take the work away from them? It's tiring. What is your allyship pledge? Are you willing to go public with it as I have today? Something you can announce to your colleagues, to your department? I am still working on my voice, remembering how others' voices have harmed me, helped me, and healed me. I'm working on being mindful of how my voice can either harm, help, or heal, both myself and others. I'm becoming more aware of the voices that I was forced to hear, those I have chosen to hear, and those I have not even considered listening to. So in this conference and beyond, I would like to invite you to become aware of the voices you are choosing to listen to and those you are not. These are my reflections that I'm sitting with and perhaps they help you to navigate your own. How do I show compassion and solidarity? To show my strength to stand strong with others when I witness them being harmed? What ways can I practice more care with my fluidity to hold multiple truths at the same time when I don't understand or agree with you? Where in me can I allow space to be accountable and take responsibility for moments where I cause or witness harm and bring humility alongside me as I do so? And this is what I'm reflecting on in both my professional and personal spheres. Do my superpower switch on and off? Do I stand on the sidelines when I'm off duty or at the weekend? What do I really mean by off duty? These are questions I grapple with as I learn to lean in and to do the work of being an ally with my peers, students, friends, family and new acquaintances. These are insights we are sitting with. What about you? And these are actions we are taking. What is your pledge? What will you do tomorrow to mobilize your learning about change making? In fact, what will you do today? Mm -hmm.